Imagine a world where labor is obsolete, where work is something of the past, but miraculously, everything's still functioning better than ever before. No, I'm not talking about a society run by robots. I'm talking about a world harnessing the power of play. And I believe that there's a lot we can learn from games to make that world happen. So today, I'm going to talk to you about how gamification can make our world a better place. So let's start with games. Who plays games? Most of the people, when they think of a gamer, they think about people like these: <laughs> little kids and guys who are probably single, probably unemployed, and eat pizza onto their shirts. <laughs> But the actual statistics could be very surprising to many. The average gamer is actually 35 years old. Almost 70 percent of them are over 18. About half of them are women, which means there's actually more adult women playing games than male under 18. If you consider social mobile games like Candy Crush or Angry Birds, so what does this mean? This means that everyone can be a gamer. This is a very generic demographic. This could be your clients, could be your employees, could be your children, could be your parents. Everyone. Has the capacity to enjoy games, if there's a good reason to do so. So, what is gamification? Gamification is the craft to take all those fun, exciting elements of games and pouring them into boring, non-game contexts. Things you have to do, but you don't necessarily want to do. So, when I say gamification, some of you might start thinking about what we call the PBLs, the points, badges, and leaderboards, and This is where a lot of people think, "Oh, if I just take points and put into a product or badges, it'll make it fun and exciting." And that's a big misconception. When I started in gamification in 2003, it was a very lonely passion for me. Very few people cared about it, and very few people understood it. Now, about three, four years ago, gamification became a buzzword, and a lot more people and companies, organizations, schools started to care about it. But still, very few people truly understand it. So, if you think about what makes a game fun, if you ask gamers that, they're not going to say, "Oh, because the game has points." They'll say, "Oh, because it challenges me. It makes me use my creativity. It allows me to hang with friends. It makes me be more than who I am today." And if you think about it, every single game out there has game elements and game mechanics in them. But most games are still boring. Most games are still not engaging. So it's very naive to think that, "Oh, if I just take..." These game elements, mechanics from that you can find in games that are even boring, and pour them into products and experiences, it'll automatically make it super fun and exciting. So what we know here is that good gamification does not start with game elements, but really starts with how it motivates our core drives. So I spent many years developing a gamification framework called Octalysis, and it's a design framework based on an octagon shape, and in the center of Octalysis are eight core drives. And I believe these are eight core drives that motivate us, motivate us to do everything that we do, in games, out of games. So I'm going to go through these eight core drives and show you one example about how something amazing out there changes the world with it. The first core drive is epic meaning and calling. This is the core drive that says you're motivated because you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. So in a game, it does that often. The world's about to end, and for some reason, you're the only person qualified to save the world. You feel big, but there's a lot of other examples to make people feel bigger than they are. It can be used to get children with cancer in children's hospital to update their pain journals, and that's what Pain Squad does. So Pain Squad is an app that gets kids to record their pain journals so doctors can diagnose them better. And you can imagine if you're a child and you have cancer, you feel lonely. You feel like no one cares about you. You're in pain. You're not very motivated to keep keep track of your pain journal. So the Pain Squad. Is an app that pretends that you're in the secret police force, dedicated to hunt down this thing called pain, and the motto is keep pain in its place. Whenever there's pain, two times a day, you got to record it down. But to reinforce on that epic meaning and calling, look what they do in the app. Hey rookie, welcome to Pain Squad. It's really great you're here. We need all the help we can get to help put pain in its place. You are now officially a full-fledged detective in Pain Squad. Well done. At this rate, you might even be the next chief. They just don't make them like you anymore. 
You truly are one of Pain Squad's best and brightest. Keep it up. But this case isn't closed yet. Your squad is still fighting. We couldn't have done it without you. So way to go. So now, when the child updates her pain journal, she's not just doing something because she has to. She feels like she's part of something important. A team depends on her. She's fighting with a team against this force called pain, and that motivates her. That's epic meaning and calling. The second core drive is development and accomplishment, and this is the core drive that says you're motivated because you feel like you're improving, you're leveling up, you're achieving mastery. And one of the most well-known examples of this core drive is the Nike Plus Nike Fuel Band. So we all know that health and exercise is very important, but it's a, health is a long-term thing, and our brains are terrible at processing long-term benefits. We like short-term gratifications. So what the Nike Plus does really well is it shows you short-term accomplishments. It shows you how, hey, you have run an extra mile compared to last week. You're improving. Your Nike Plus score is getting higher, and so you feel accomplished. You feel I'm growing. I'm getting better. I'm leveling up, and that motivates you. And to further drive that feeling of accomplishment, it also introduces a character to celebrate with you whenever you hit a new milestone. So this little character jumps up and down, so excited, so happy. He falls on his face, and he's like, "Yeah, ten thousand Nike fuel points earned. You feel accomplished." The third core drive is empowerment of creativity and feedback. So that's kind of like Lego. You give users the basic building blocks, and there's an infinite amount of ways for you to utilize your creativity, to try different combinations, strategies, see feedback, and adjust. And that's a very engaging process. So my favorite example in Core Drive Three is the serious game called Folded. So scientists have been trying to figure out this、uh, AIDS virus protein structure problem, and the top PhDs in the world couldn't figure this out for 15 years. So they decided to make a game called Folded. And as you can see, you have a big protein. There's things you can do with it. You have an objective such as maximizing surface space. And miraculously, this problem that no one could solve was solved by a gamer in 10 days. So when you think about how a 15-year-old problem is solved in 10 days through a game, you have to see how powerful games can be in making our world a better place. The fourth core drive is ownership and possession. This is the core drive that says because you feel like you own something, you want to improve it, you want to protect it, and you want to get more. So this is the core drive that powers a lot of virtual goods, virtual currency, things like that. It's also the core drive that motivates us to accumulate wealth. But it can also get us to learn math. Dragon Box is a learning game that gets little kids between five to nine years old to be obsessed with solving hundreds of middle school algebra questions. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, math was the ultimate school grind. Like everything else could be fun, you know, physics can be fun, science, history can be fun, but math, no, math is not fun. Math, you just sit there and you have to do it, so your parents don't get mad at you. So. Check out how Dragon Box gets this to be fun for little kids. So the premise of the game is that you have a box, and inside the box there's a baby dragon. This baby dragon only wants to come out when nothing's around it, so it can eat. So this is the onboarding stage, teaching the rules. These green circles you see are zeros in disguise. Zero means nothing, so you tap on it, it disappears. Zero means nothing. It scans. The dragon wants to come out and eat happy. Now, on stage three, it introduces some basic math principles: positive robot and negative robot cancel each other out, become zero. Negative two and positive two cancel each other out, become zero. And now the dragon scans, and the dragon wants to come out and eat again. And you can see the little dragon turns from an egg to a little baby. Nice. At one, one point, it gets pretty complex. The dragon box becomes an X, and you're trying to isolate that X. So you have, see, you have to do things like balance both sides of the equation, multiply everything by two. You also need to make sure the numbers are optimally solved, so no two over four. So you can see in this process, the child is trying to make sure something this is optimally solved, and the dragon will eat it because it's yummy. But the other two, they're not. So dragon refuses to eat it. That those will be yuck. As you can see, it'll be yum yuck yuck. You know, bad numbers. Dragons don't like bad numbers. So the child only gets one star out of three. So now the child doesn't even know he's doing math. He's just trying to feed his dragon. Grows dragon. He's like, oh, why don't I get three stars? I got to figure out a better way to 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 isolate this so the dragon wants to eat everything. Something really, really amazing. The fifth core drive of octalysis is social influence and relatedness. This is pretty straightforward. This is 
basically what you do based on what other people think, do, or say. And my favorite example here is O Power. O Power is a utility SaaS company that tries to get people to lower their utility bills. And they saw that the best way to change people's behavior is to show them how their neighbors are doing. You show them <laughs> their utility, how much you're using, your best neighbor, and your average neighbor. And everyone who always thinks they're somewhat a little above average, which is impossible, you can't have everyone above average. When they see that, they're like, "Oh, I need to change my behavior." So, with O Power, within a year, they saved over 250 million dollars of utility bills, and that's a lot of electricity over one tera terawatt. The sixth core drive of Octalysis is in scarcity and impatience. So, this is a core drive that says you want something just because you can't have it. Like if grapes are on the table, you really don't care about the grapes. But if they're on a shelf just beyond your reach, you're always thinking about those grapes. You know, can I have them? When can I have them? Are they even sweet? And <laughs> Kickstarter is a great example that utilizes a lot of great game design techniques. They first dangle this great reward, this great prize in front of you, cool technology. Then they show you what we call a countdown timer: 21 days to go. You have to act now. If you don't act now, you won't get this prize. So the sense of urgency. Then it shows you what we call the last mile drive. Oh, there's only three thousand dollars left. Only two thousand more, and we'll get it. You'll get it. And then finally, all together, this is what we call a group quest. You can only get, you can only accomplish the quest when an entire team uh, moves forward together on it. The seventh core drive is unpredictability and curiosity. This is the core drive that says, because you don't know what's going to happen next, you're always thinking about it. And this is the core drive that's heavily utilized in the gambling industry, but it's also the core drive that makes us want to finish a book or watch a movie. And it can also be used for a lot of other good things, like getting people to obey the speed limit. This is a speed cam lottery. How it works is, whenever you drive by the speed cam lottery and you're speeding, it will take a picture of your car and it'll give you a fine. Pretty straightforward. But when you're going by the, the speed cam lottery and you're within the speed limit, it'll enter into a lottery pot where you can, when you have a chance, to win the money from those who are fine. <laughs> so, even though it, your chance of winning is fairly low and it's not a lot of money to begin with, because everyone thinks that, oh, maybe I'll win this time, maybe I'll win this time, you try, you change your behavior, slow down, huh? You know. So, speed cam lottery successfully reduces. The, the speed of passing cars by 20 percent, very tangible. The eighth and final core drive is loss and avoidance, and this is also straightforward. It's you're doing something to avoid a loss. You don't want bad things to happen. And my favorite example here is called Zombies Run. Now, remember, we, in Core Drive Two, we talk about Nike Plus motivating people to run to make them feel accomplished, feel like they're growing, feel like they're improving. Now, Zombies Run makes people run because they don't want to be eaten by zombies. <laughs> so, Zombies Run is a game that pretends you're in this apocalyptic world where zombies have taken over everything, and you're this runner in the in the wilderness, in the world of zombies, and you're running with earphones on. And there's a radio station with with,、uh, with binoculars talking to you, saying, "Hey, careful, runner five. There's a horde of zombies on the west. Oh, careful! There's a zombie right behind you, and he's gaining on you." And then you hear sounds, <laughs> and you're like, "Crap! I gotta run faster. I don't want to be eaten." Right? So again, now you're eating because you don't. You're, you're running because you don't want to be eaten by zombies. A very strong motivation. <laughs> so. These are the eight core drives of Octalysis, and like I said, I believe every single thing you do is based on one or more of these core drives. But it's also put together on an octagon shape for a reason. The left side core drives are more extrinsic motivation core drives, which means you're doing these things for a goal, for a purpose, for a reward. The ones on the right are the intrinsic motivation core drives, which means you're doing it because it's just enjoyable. You don't need a reward to use your creativity. You don't need a reward to hang out with friends, and you don't necessarily need to gain anything by being in the suspense of unpredictability. In fact, most people have fun losing money in casinos. And if you notice, the core drives on the top are more positive. I call them white hat、uh, gamification techniques. So if you're always doing something because you feel like you're being something part of being part of something bigger than yourself. And you're growing, you're improving, and you're using your creativity. It feels very, very good. It feels like you're in control. You're powerful. The ones on the bottom, I call them black hat game techniques. And if you're always doing something just because you want to avoid a loss, just because you don't know what's going to happen next, or you can't have something, it's going to be very, very powerful in motivation. But sometimes, in the long run, leaves a bad taste in your mouth, and it's not a very sustainable long-term design. 
So once you have that framework, you can start analyzing why different things are engaging and motivating. You can look at Facebook, how, it's, how it motivates us, and maybe it lacks a little bit of epic meaning and calling, maybe a little bit of scarcity. You know, you, you can, there's a, basically everything you want you can get on Facebook. You can look at things like LinkedIn, right? And LinkedIn, yeah, there's not a lot of space to utilize your creativity on LinkedIn. You create a profile, you look at people, that's about it. But it is relatively important. There's ownership, it's your own life. There's a lot of things in LinkedIn that's, that engages people. So that's just level one octalysis. There's actually five levels in total, and it gets a lot more complicated later on. But the premise is this. Good gamification design is a complex subject. It's not just slapping on points, badges, leaderboard, game mechanics onto an experience. It's never a cookie cutter solution. And so when I started in 2003, I had a vision. I foresaw a world where there's no longer a divide between what you have to do and what you want to do. And in this world, all you have to do is play all day. And everything you need to do is getting done. You support your family, you have better relationships, your organizations perform better, and society overall becomes more productive. And I work every single day of my life to push towards that vision. But there's only so much I can do by myself. So that's why I need you to be part of that journey with me so that we create a world where whenever we wake up in the morning, we'll say, wow, that dream was amazing, but I'm so glad I woke up and back to reality because that's where the real fun is at. Thank you.